My husband was very ill for about three and a half years, um, had a kidney transplant. Doctors really couldn't figure out what was wrong. We went to medical teaching institutions around the country. He was never diagnosed. At his death, an autopsy was performed, and about a month later, I got the results of the autopsy, and that's when I knew it was Erdheim-Chester disease. Erdheim-Chester disease is a devastating disease. It's one which little is known about. It seems to attack different patients in different ways. One patient may have bones and heart impacted, whereas another patient might have kidney and their brain affected by the disease. And it's one of the things that makes the disease extremely puzzling. It is a, a debilitating disease and one that leaves people feeling very isolated and alone. So Erham Chester disease belongs to the histiocytic disorders, which basically histiocytes are specific uh, white blood cells, which are the blood cells of our immune system that help us defend ourselves of bacteria, viruses, or whatever bad substance comes into our body. So these specific cells, these specific white blood cells called histiocytes, they proliferate in, and infiltrate tissues. They are supposed to do their job when they're created and then die afterwards, but in this uh, situation, they continue to proliferate. That's why it's called histiocytosis, because the histiocytes continue to uh, grow nonstop, basically, until they produce some disease. He actually started becoming ill in 1980 with high blood pressure. He had a stressful job. He was a superintendent of schools in Louisiana, and they attributed the high blood pressure to stress on the job. Around 2000, the blood pressure kept getting worse, and they thought then that high blood pressure had caused kidney issues. And he went into kidney failure, um, did dialysis, had a transplant, and he kept getting sicker and sicker after the transplant. They thought that it had something to do with the drugs they had to keep him on to keep the kidney functioning. And then they just weren't sure. Uh, doctors just kept searching and looking and no one ever found what the root cause was. It was one of the scariest things, one of the loneliest things that I think that I ever hope I have to experience. It's just not knowing, watching someone you love suffer and not being able to help. Currently we have seen 30 patients here at the NIH up to date. And I've seen patients from just having bone complaints and they're uh, intellectually intact. They're able to, to ambulate and do their daily activities up to patients that need a wheelchair and assistance with feeding. And all that depends on where this infiltration of histiocytes is affecting them. So even though I've seen 30 patients every week, every patient brings me something new. The disorder is, is rare, meaning some doctors probably never heard of it while they were in medical school or while they were in residency. So usually the patient comes to the clinic complaining of lower extremity pain, pain in their bones, or that they're tired. When they develop more symptomatology, like fever or some sort of hormonal imbalance, they start doing deeper testing. But by this time, probably six months have passed or maybe a year. And they see something that hits the flag that, oh, this could be cancer. This could be a lymphoma. So they start doing the cancer workup. And if somebody decides to do a biopsy of an affected tissue, the biopsy is going to come, no, oh, this is not cancer. And some places just close the, the chart and they follow the patients and, well, it's not cancer. And that's what we don't want, but we don't know what it is. Until other manifestations show up and then they have to revisit the case and other centers are consulted and more experienced pathologists in histocytic disorders see the slides, see the biopsy, they consider what can, what hasn't been done to be done, and then they get the diagnosis. My journey started way before I actually knew that my journey had begun. Um, 
when I still lived in Scotland. I was about maybe 25 at the time and I suddenly got this unquenchable thirst which turned out to be diabetes insipidus. At that point they did some MRIs, I was in hospital, nothing. Um, they couldn't see any reason for it so I just started taking the medication and just kind of get on with my life. Um, I then you know, moved to the States, May of 1999 and everything was going very well. Then I started having seizures. So my PCP sent me to ear, nose and throat doctor. And while I was there, I had the seizure. Well, she kind of freaked out just a little, called the ambulance um, and made me go and get an MRI. And then all of a sudden the tech reappeared and said, this is doctor such and such. And at that time you just go, <sighs> you know, and it's like, can we have somewhere quiet we can talk? And it's like, <sighs> so they take you into the little changing room and they say, we we'll found a mass on your brainstem. So, it's a bit of a shock, to be honest. Um, and when I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, we all got together and we all drew something. Memories, you know? Things that we'd done on our canoe trips and things like that. And when I died, we were, they were all going to cut it up and they were all going to get their piece of this table and then every year they were going to get together, put the table back together and have a celebration. So at that point the steroids were just getting to be out of control. I was on 60 milligrams a day, I had night sweats, I was huge um, and nothing was working. Um, then they went back and looked at the, um, the biopsy again and right at the very bottom the pathologist had written but we cannot rule out airtime Chester disease and November of 2011 they gave me the diagnosis. The first thing that a patient does when they get diagnosed with a rare disorder is go to Google, put the name of the disease and read whatever shows up. They will see that Patients probably die three years after diagnosis and they are basically just condemned. And then there's no treatment that we don't know what's happening and this is a death sentence for them. That's what a lot of patients get. But now, with the research that's being done here, being done in Europe, um, this has changed. We've seen patients that have been with the condition for 10 years or more treated with the new medication that had been recommended. They're empirical because they're not treating the disease yet, but they are prolonging their life and they're keeping them stable and they can live life somehow. I had had to stop running actually about 10 years ago because of pretty severe back pain. So the choice was either have a back operation or switch from running to biking. And so I chose the latter. And then I developed knee pain in my right knee. Uh, so I went back to the doctor and so he did an MRI on my knee and found that I had a, a torn meniscus in my right knee, but uh, there was also some funny stuff in the bone marrow around my knee joint that uh, the uh, radiologist who initially read it couldn't, couldn't figure out. Uh, it was something infiltrative and abnormal and of course, the first thing any, or all of us thought of is that I had cancer or leukemia or something. And so the radiologist that initially read it showed it to other members of his staff and uh, of his uh, department and they all um, had different opinions. But one guy said, gee, that's, that looks like Erdheim Chester disease. And everyone else looked at him and says, what is that? No one had ever heard of that condition, much less knew how to diagnose it. But he. He thought that that's what it was and everyone was pretty skeptical. And sure enough, the um, pathology report came back as uh, classic or Chester disease.
and I tend to put stuff on the right that I haven't used yet. Then once I use it, I put it on the left, just so I know this has been used. And I bend my Q-tips, you know, so I know that they've been in the air before, just so I don't breathe and go, oh, that's wet. Oh. Who knows what cheer that was in. Uh, okay, Lance, why don't you go ahead and shut the door? Yeah. And I'll bring your clothes in for you, okay? Okay. Call her if you need me. I will. When Lance was first diagnosed with Erdheim Chester disease, we received a document describing the disease and it was I believe three pages and I did so much research looking for information on it and I couldn't find anything there was just nothing out there and it felt like this was just a death sentence based on the paperwork that we were given and it was devastating and then not being able to find anybody else out there really or not very many people who we're going through the same thing, it was really, it ju I just felt very alone because our life was changing so much and being so young, we didn't have anybody else that could relate to what we were going through. And we went from being very social to really keeping to ourselves. I started searching on the internet to just learn as much as I could. It was just a way for me to cope with some of the grief. And as I did that, I came across a couple of wives of other Erdheim Chester disease patients. And we were talking, we'd start having phone calls, emails, and it became obvious that we all felt isolated, alone, frustrated, um, and that if we felt that way, there were probably others in the world who felt similar. So we tried to figure out what could we do, how could we help the situation, and we came up with the idea of a chat session, an online chat room. We started the chat session with six patients, and um, that quickly grew to about nine patients. And based on that, there we, we formed friendships and bonds. Um, it felt a little less alone. And that was really the beginning of the organization. My wife I, uh, discovered the Global Alliance and the, the principal feature for someone like me was their weekly uh, chat line. For one hour every week, um, uh, I speak in our speaking uh, by way of the computer with uh, people who with Erdogan Chester all around the world and certainly all around the country. And they're all so different from me that I often wonder if it's the same disease. It's not just that they're, um, they, their symptoms are different. Some of them are in great pain. Some one young woman has gone blind. And, and some of them are suffering so much. Many of them went undiagnosed or misdiagnosed for years because it's, you know, I, you know I, no one I ever meet, no doctor, no, much less any layman, has ever heard of Erdheim Chester. It's, it's always Erdheim Chester. And, um, and so I'm not surprised that, you know, there's a guy in rural Canada, there's, there's um, that the people all over the United States and spent two, three years with symptoms. They, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, until finally it was determined to start Chester. And, and I'm sure there's thousands of people around the world who have it right now and don't know they have it. how much information is available on the ECD Global Alliance website. It is 
a great resource for anybody who wants to find out anything about the disease from somebody who knows nothing about it to doctors who have been treating Lance. And he is at a teaching hospital, so we deal with medical students and residents all the time. And they always bring me in to ask questions because I've been doing this for so long, and I always refer them to the ECD Global Alliance website. My name is Paul Montgomery. I'm a medical oncologist. I work here at the VA part-time and at Mountain States Tumor Institute, part of St. Luke's Hospital here in Boise. Before I met Lance, I didn't even know what Erdheim Chester disease was. Not long after we had uh, been treating uh, Lance for uh, a while, the uh, uh, Erdheim uh, Chester disease and global alliance system came into being. And I was able to use it to converse with researchers. Uh, there was a physician who had an interest in uh, Erdheim Chester disease in Italy, and we actually used that to uh, make a treatment plan. Um, I like to think that he would be proud. I, I promised him when he got sick that we would find out what was making him sick and we would fight it. And I hope he knows that I'm honoring that commitment. It feels great that patients are finding doctors who know about ECD. It brings hope to the entire community.